Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Brad Jackson. I'm superintendent director here at Shawsheen and welcome to our first parent forum. Um, joining me today is um, high school principal Jess Cook and she and I together are going to try to answer some general questions that you may have. I'm getting text messages. Don't mind me. Uh, um, so I'm turning my phone to silent. Um, so we're, we're here to answer questions uh, as they come in. Um, you're going to uh, you will see a question and answer box on your screen where you can type in questions. Um, and uh, we um, wanted to provide you this opportunity today to um, answer, ask any anything that uh, is on your mind. Um, we our suggestion is it not be too specific to your own individual child. Um, this is a um, this is a live event and is something that um, um, we can't guarantee uh, complete privacy for um, our parents or um, our uh, um, and any, anything that might be said. So we would suggest that you try to um, keep these questions uh, on the generic side so that um, we don't impact your child's privacy. Um, so joining me also is uh, Jess Cook, the principal here at Shawsheen. Um, and I see we have a few uh, questions already coming in. Um, I really don't want to make an opening statement other than to say um, thank you everyone for your flexibility and for your patience. Um, this has been um, trying to hit a moving target um, from a thousand yards away. Um, and I feel good about the plan that we have, um, but it took some time to get there. And I appreciate your patience while we worked out the work through a lot of things that required that. Uh, we also just completed a, uh, uh, what was scheduled to be a one hour Q&A session with our staff um, that we actually had to cut off so that we could turn over to this one. Um, but they also had a lot of good questions, um, but there is an excitement that I feel on the part of our staff. They're anxious to return. They're anxious to see your students um, whether it be remote or face to face um, and they're anxious to get to get started with this school year. So with that, um, Jess, I'll turn this over to you um, to moderate the session and answer a lot of questions I hope too. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I'll just reiterate what Dr. Jackson has said. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to the opportunity to answer your questions and help you feel more settled about the start of the coming school year. Um, you know, we're all navigating a, a situation that we wouldn't have chosen, but we're going to do our best to keep everyone safe and make the best of it. Um, and so I'm going to do my best over here to switch between my screen and Dr. Jackson's, depending on who's answering. Um, and I'll jump in with our first question. So what about school supplies? Um, will there be a list of what they need? We don't supply a, a list of what students need for the school year. Um, you know, once students are placed in shops, there's supplies that students uh, have to get depending on the shop, but there isn't a school year supply list. So thank you. That's a great question. So our next question for students who select full remote learning and are in construction shops where remote learning is not possible. What are their options to receive credit? Can they take a different class? My child is a rising senior applying to colleges, so earning credit in all of her classes is required. Thank you, this is an excellent question. Um, we know it's on a lot of people's minds and it's something we're working with. Um, we are actively assessing the list of students being submitted to us who have requested to be remote 100% of the time, which would alter their shop week, which is our in-person week. And based on the shops, we are exploring different alternatives for how students could get delivered those materials. For some areas, there are online options. For others, um, like actual um, courses set up in the CTE area by other vendors, that could be an option. For others, our instructors um, will be working and putting things together. And so that's a big piece of what we'll be finalizing with staff during those 10 additional days. And so our goal is for students to receive you know, the full range of credit of what they would get and not detract from their transcript for college purposes. So although 
what they're actually doing might look different than if they'd been in, let's say, the carpentry class that day. We're not going to look at you and say your student is going to lose out on 20 credits. That's not something that would happen. So thank you very much. Uh, next comment, thank you for doing this. You're welcome. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be here. So next question, have we decided on a plan for those who have to remote learn, especially if one student is ninth grade? Um, and I'm wondering if this person um, could provide a little more clarification on the question. Um, I, I'm not sure if this is just for, if this is about the high needs students who might come into school or students who will be home. Um, but what I will say that generally speaking, you know, we are, in the process of getting the list together of students um, who we consider high needs and figuring out how many we can fit in the building to reach out to parents in the coming weeks about that. So that is one plan that we are working for right now. The other piece is remote learning for all of our students that will be remote during academic, academic week. And so the plan with that is we're going to be utilizing um, a common format. So Microsoft Teams is the format through which students will connect to the video and teachers will be able to post assignments. Um, and we'll be providing training for our staff during the 10 days so that they can use that consistently. And then we're also going to be providing opportunities for staff and students to connect to events such as these um, to sort of go through that back end. Because we also think that if parents are able to see, you know, what is the view your student will see and how do they access that, um, that could be another layer of support. Um, we'll also leverage time students are in the building who are struggling leveraging those platforms. For instance, ninth graders during their, their first weeks, if they've never used them, will rotate through a technology orientation. So those are some of the things that we have in place. And, and to be entirely honest, you know, we've never run a remote academic week before um, in the context that we'll be now returning to our full scope and sequence of instruction. So we're going to continually assess and adjust um, to make improvements as we go through. Um, so we, we are not starting this with a fixed mindset of it's only going to look this way. We will do what we need to do throughout to make things better and improve. So students on IEPs, how are their services going to be handled? So um, our new support services director, Jeff Albert, will be working with his department and start communicating um, with parents about um, the, how to structure changes um, on service delivery based on the remote learning period, period of time. So information to that will be forthcoming. He will be reaching out to families of students on IEPs. So that is definitely something we are working on. Uh, the next question, same question, so I, I won't repeat that. So what is the matrix that you are using to move from the hybrid to all in or at school or to fully remote learning? And I, I'm guessing this question is asking about the whole school to move between the three. Um, and I, and uh, Brad, I'd love for you to step in and address that one. Oh, Brad, you're muted. I was going to make a smart aleck mark. Now that I'm muted, I can't couldn't do that. Um, so obviously, we are going to we we are hopeful that um, this plan is temporary, and we would love nothing more than to return all of our students um, to to in person model ASAP. Um, but we at the same time we have to be um, ready to move to a uh, hundred percent. Uh, remote, both for our um, academics and for um, for um, uh, for shop. Um, so part of the work we're going to be doing during the ten days um, uh, on the shop side is helping those teachers prepare for the possibility that at some point in time we may have to be one hundred percent remote, which would mean 
that shops would be all of our shop students would be 100 percent remote as well so that's an issue that um, we are going to be addressing as part of our professional development plan during the first 10 days of school when students are not going to be in session um, so uh, so we're going to be focusing primarily as i said on uh, opening on our current opening plan uh, and then uh, with an emphasis for our shop teachers to be able to sh uh, shift to remote if it's if it's required Now you're muted, Jess. You're still muted. Thank you. I thought I hit the button. Um, has any decision been made for sports this fall, specifically football? Um, so the information was just released yesterday. Um, we at at Shawshine um, have not made any local decisions about how we're structuring things with that guidance just coming out. It's going to be one of the next things that we dive into. Uh, but football, from what I read, is being moved out of the traditional fall season. So that wouldn't be starting up um, on the proposed date of September 18th. So we will get more information out to you um, after we've gone through everything, but we don't have any definitives today. Is there anything you want to add to that, Brad? Um. Yes, please. So, um, I um, again, we just um, got this. Uh, the decision was finalized by the MIA Board of Directors and the Commissioner just this morning, um, and so we, none of us have really had much of an opportunity to digest it, um, and um, um, so. We will be providing if there are some local decisions that are involved in that um, that will um, that are involved um, or that DESE is allowing or requiring local school districts to make, then we will be doing that in conjunction with um, our um, partner, our league partners, and um, also members of our local. Um, uh, uh, the local health directors uh, in our communities. Um, I um, I saw that I did sneak a peek at, at one of the questions um, a little ahead, asked for my personal opinion about some of this stuff, um, and I um, I really am um, I'm I'm at, I'm still struggling with it a little bit. There are um, there this while I am a a huge um, supporter of uh, high school athletics. Uh, my son is a football coach, um, uh, and um, uh, we uh, try to. I try to attend as many of his games as I can. In addition to, I'm looking forward to attending games here as well. Um, this, uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions around this. Particularly, how do we get students who are remote back to school for things like practice? How do we do that equitably? How do we do that safely? Um, and uh, so, um, I'm I'm uh, I'm still processing it, and I'm I have to be honest with you that I'm I'm uh, I'm somewhat surprised by the decision. I thought it would. Um, it would go another way. Um, and um, so I have to, so I guess I'll leave it at that. So our next question, will students be able to see one another or just the teacher during remote academics? Uh, so in Microsoft Teams, students will be able to see one another and the teacher when the teacher is presenting. Um, and we are putting together a code of conduct um, and expectations around how students participate remotely, um, as well as parameters just to, to protect everyone's uh, safe participation. Um, the same rules in school for how students treat one another uh, are in effect in those environments, but we will be putting language to that to make sure that that can be uh, a safe and productive experience for everyone. Uh, 
So thank you for your question. Our next question, incoming freshmen do not really have an assigned shock yet. How is that going to work initially for the first week or two? So um, students will be provided their first shock that they're going to before they enter the building. And when students arrive that day and we're working on, you know, entry plans and drop off plans and, and all those protocols to ensure safety in those transitions, um, students will know in advance where they're reporting. And then we're going to have staff assigned, you know, throughout the school and the hallways to help direct students where they need to go. Also to just oversee um, and manage the flow of students during that time. Um, so students that will be communicated to students. So thank you for your question. How will high needs students be identified for in school academic weeks? So DESI has provided guidance on that. So what we're currently doing through the special ed office and the guidance and health services office is identifying students who fall into the categories that they have outlined. So the two categories they have prioritized are students um, with high needs disabilities. Um, so uh, within our list of students on IEPs, sort of prioritizing based on what the needs of students are um, and English language learners. In addition to that, those being the priorities, they've also named students who have home environments that aren't conducive to participating in remote learning, um, specifically noting homeless students and students um, in foster situations as well as next on the list are students who struggled academically, as well as students who did not perform well under remote learning in the spring. And so what we're doing, we'll get those lists together and we imagine some students will fall on multiple lists and through that, um, compare that list to capacity wise, how many we can safely bring in the building um, and then start having conversations with parents uh, either or along the lines of we've identified your student as a high need student, for uh, in-person learning and making that decision jointly because some some parents might feel safety wise they still don't want their student in the building and that, that you know that's certainly um, their right and then having conversations with parents um, of students on IEPs if there is a cohort that we can't bring in the building based on working that process having that discussion as well um, and, and that may cha change things it may not so there is definitely a sort of data-based process on our end here at Shawshine, but it will be a collaborative process and conversations with parents as well. Um, it is not a fixed decision at the start of the year. We will continue to monitor and assess student performance and need throughout the school year, um, and there may, may be changes to that. And ultimately, we think uh, safety increases and we are able to bring more students back in the building. Um, so I, I absolutely recognize that parents, you know, probably would have liked to know if their students were on that list, you know, a week ago. Um, but we're doing our due diligence with that process and we'll be reaching out in the coming weeks to have those conversations. So thank you. Our next question, will the academic week be scheduled like a regular day or will it be like it was in the spring? Um, nothing will be like it was in the spring. That was emergency remote learning. That is over. Uh, we are moving into a time where remote learning is happening because it has to due to safety, but expectations for students, student learning growth and achievement, we are striving to meet what we typically would. And so students will follow the bell schedule periods one through eight, logging into teams with their teachers in their class every period. Um, because it's not good teaching practice, it doesn't mean that students will be sitting and listening to lectures eight periods a day. Uh, teachers will be structuring their weeks, so there are some times where there might be lecture or note taking, other times where students may be working um, in groups, which there are some options in teams to do that, other times where students may be working independently, so the teacher can do some individual check-ins, and so um, it will model as closely as possible to what we're able to do in school. Um, and attendance will be taken, work will be graded, um, and and we will be producing sort of some modifications to sections in the student handbook, but the same rules will apply about coming to school on time and all things of that nature with some changes regarding the notification process. Because obviously a student, let's say, who needs to be dismissed on a Tuesday, but is remote, you know, can't bring a note into the front office. So we'll be spelling all that out for everyone. 
Our next question, um, I would feel more comfortable with my child starting fully remote. As the data continues to be accrued, is my child able to transfer to the hybrid model in October, November? Um, and Brad, I'd like to kick this one over to you. Thanks, Jess. Um, so the answer to that question is yes, um, provided we have the capacity and the cap capability, the capacity, the physical capacity to do that. Um, again, the um, since academics is remote um, to begin, um, what you are um, opting to do or what you're considering doing is uh, to have your student participate in uh, shop remotely as well. Um, that, um, you know, I think it's, I, I think in spite of every effort we make, there are some shops that this is going to be um, easier to accomplish than others. Um, and, but if, if and when, um, you know, the data makes sense to you to uh, return your child to a hybrid model, um, taking, assuming we're in a hybrid model in October or November, um, then you can take advantage, then you can shift. It's not a permanent, um, it's not a permanent uh, decision. Brad, I'll send you this next question as well. Um, so would you please run through the cleaning policy the school will be using, what will be done, how frequently, et cetera? Sure. So um, I want to, I, 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 I've asked this question a lot, so I want to answer this question um, uh, a little um, uh, more broadly to begin with. So the, um, the, the, um, guidelines that we have been given um, essentially take a three-part approach to student and staff safety in the building. The first and most important um, rule about maintaining student and staff safety is wearing a mask. The second is maintaining physical distancing of six feet when possible and a minimum of three feet. The third is frequent hand washing or hand sanitizing. And then the fourth is cleaning, um, cleaning and sanitizing um, surfaces. Um, and along, along with surfaces is maintaining um, clean air in the building. So that's kind of the other that's the safety like um, cleaning and building environment safety piece that I'm going to talk about now. So there's two pieces to that. One is our HVAC system, which is going to be designed, which is designed to bring in fresh air um, and also, uh, but can be adjusted to bring in minimal amounts of fresh air or maximum amounts of fresh air. Um, and those adjustments are being made so that we bring in maximum amount of fresh air. Um, also, we've been instructed to um, open many, uh, as many of our windows as possible during the school day when uh, we are occupied. Um, so that is the other piece of safety, the, the final being um, sanit cleaning and sanitizing. So um, I think while while it is in, it intuitively obvious to all of us that um, particularly high touch areas cannot be are become unsanitary the moment the first person touches them. Um, high touch areas, uh, according to DESI guidelines, need to be cleaned a minimum of three, uh, sanitized a minimum of three times per day. Um, and those uh, and those guidelines are, will be and are going to be followed, um, and that includes um, areas uh, such as bathrooms, doorknobs, those types of things. Um, the uh, because the shops are um, are going to be 
um, um, limited to the uh, one cohort of students. Um, we'll be able to, um, um, during a week, we'll be able to, um, we won't, those spaces will not, because we're not turning over, they're the same number of same students, um, that we can, don't need to focus our sanitation efforts as much in those particular areas, allowing us to focus on what is essentially a key part of uh, the vocational um, experience, which is sometimes shared equipment and shared tools. Um, that is where a lot of our focus is going to take place on the sanitizing and cleaning side. We are going to be establishing protocols um, with students that get them in the habit of cleaning a tool, whether it be a drill or access to a uh, a saw that, that we only have one saw in this particular area or um, for example um, where they um, they use sanitizing wipes to wipe the surfaces uh, both after use and before um, and then the student who's coming in to use it uh, wipes it off before and after very similar actually to the protocols um, that I've been using at Planet Fitness um, when on the um, on the treadmill so um, those types of protocols are in place. The equipment um, is available to do that. We've talked to staff about um, managing that. Um, uh, on the academic side, um, we're still working on student schedules and where they're going to be if they are um, um, they are part of our smaller in-school cohort. Um, and um, those uh, those protocols. So we're I'm, I'm hopeful that we can keep those students um, in the same area um, all day um, if or and, and then if not, we'll have to work on um, sanitizing desks and those types of things between usage. Um, but hopefully because we'll have a smaller number of students on the academic side, that won't be necessary. I'll take this. So the question is, when will our children receive their schedules? So um, definitely before school starts for students, because we're going to need to get information out to 10th and 12th graders about how to connect remotely that week. Um, 9th and 11th grade, well, 9th graders are going to need to know where to go. Um, but it will be um, a little more time. It won't be before staff is back in, because although most of our schedule is set, uh, two things uh, may change at this point that we don't want people to send a bunch of questions about their schedule until these changes are made. The first is that the teacher assignments will probably change for many students once we know what our in-school cohort is um, because we're going to restructure some classes based on what that cohort looks like. Uh, the second piece is that we're still um, working out when students go to different shops based on their exploratory preferences, trying to get their top choices at the beginning of the school year, since that's a process that we don't always do to the extent we will this year. Um, we, we need to put a little more attention into that. So definitely before students come back in time to get them that info, um, but probably another week or two at least. Uh, so just expect that. So another question is around whether co-op eligibility is the same since no letter, letter grade in last quarter. Um, we have not made changes to that. The co-op office um, will continue to send communications out um, and this will come out in future principals updates. But in terms of seniors out on co-op, since they won't be in the building during academic week, we will need them to come in um, that first Monday of their first shop week and then they can return to co-op for the rest of the time um, and so if you have any specific like student specific eligibility questions um, please reach out to our co-op office or you can email me um, if you want to know about your child's situation so our next question is what is being done to keep distance in the hallways excellent question so one of the the nice things about you know having students mainly just in for shop week is 
the hallways will have students in them um, much less frequently because when you're in shop for the day, you only leave to go to lunch. Um, despite that, we already have um, signs on the floors all over the school uh, noting the social, social distancing link um, and with arrows on other side because we are able, to, aside from two hallways, we are able to keep six feet of dif distance with lanes on each side of the hallway. Um, the two library hallways, for those of you who are familiar with the building, are too narrow. So each of those will be a one-way hallway. Um, we'll have staff and administrators positioned in the hallway at key times throughout the day, which are the entry um, in between all of the lunches and at the end of the day. Um, and so, you know, hallways is definitely an area that we have on our radar and we're making progress with. So thank you for your question. So what does the option have shock week be remote as well? Great question. So any parent that wants their student to be remote both weeks um, may do so in uh, the principal's update that went out on Monday. There was a survey to fill out. Um, we, I will be sending another update out by the end of the week and in every update over the, you know, the next few, I'll re, um, I'll re-include that link in there for parents. Um, and if in terms of you know what that will look like, I spoke a little bit to this earlier, but exactly what they'll be doing during shop week will vary depending on the shop. And uh, we'll be having communications individually with those, those parents and students about what that will look like for those special situations. Thank you for your question. Uh, next question, hello, Mr. Jackson and Ms. Cook. Thank you for hosting this forum. Please let me know what special ed needs, tutoring, after school help from teachers would be offered students on an IEP or not. Um, great question. So that is something we are working on. Um, teachers do have to provide extra help at least uh, two days a week. So we are sorting out whether uh, what that will look like in terms of um, being both remote on the academic weeks and if we can safely allow that to be um, in person on shop week for students to see academic teachers. And so we are um, also having our guidance department when they come back talk about ways that they can support students um, who are not in because they are an IEP. Because we recognize that it doesn't matter if a student's on an IEP or not, remote learning is new and challenging to everyone. And so a big piece of what is going into the planning for curriculum and instruction for academic departments is start, starting with that belief in mind. Um, and our teachers are very aware of it. They're advocates for our students. And so, um, yeah, the supports won't just be for students on IEPs. So thank you, great question. So please explain what will be done for the one-to-one -one devices the students will be using. Um, so Shawshin isn't currently one-to-one, -one, um, but what we are doing is any student who is indicated by contacting the shrimp or through the survey uh, that they do not have a device for the at-home week or um, when they are remote for academics, uh, we are setting up to sign them out devices. For the shops that use devices, um, there's a, a range of things that are being done. In some shops, students have a specific device assigned to them. Um, and so other students won't be using them. And so we're not worried about, you know, passing back and forth and transmission that way. Um, in some shops, there are enough devices that during the whole week um, that they're in there, one student is on that device. And then the next week, another student um, from another grade would be using. So we definitely be doing deep cleans in between for those. And then we have a couple of shops where there are devices, but they don't use them all day. So different students might use them between the day, but they're but they're like uh, numbered. And so what the teachers would do, you know, if you have two, two grades in um, saying, you know, device one can be used by these students and then the, a, pro a protocol will be in place to clean them in between student use. So we have a couple different situations to navigate, um, but we'll be working to ensure safety in all of them. So thank you for your question. Um, I think Dr. Jackson spoke to this. I know some folks, as you're sending in questions, you don't know that, you know, it's already in the queue from someone else. Um, the question, is there an option to change from full remote uh, to hybrid for an individual student? And, and Dr. Jackson can speak to that. So I'll move on from there. Will there be buses this year? Uh, yes, there will be buses, but we are limited in uh, capacity. Dr. Jackson, did you want to add anything about buses? 
Um, just to say that they are, as uh, Ms. Cook said, they are limited in capacity. We can only, uh, a, a bus that traditionally can hold up to 77 students, although the high school level, that would be very tight, um, can now only um, handle 21, assuming that all of the students are, non, uh, are not related or from the same household. Um, so uh, we are hoping, um, and that's one of the reasons why we sent out a survey asking people to, um, uh, if they would be using bus services, uh, we're hoping that we can uh, serve the people that require bus services with our current fleet with that reduced capacity because only two grades would be coming to school at one time, plus the academic students who uh, are considered high needs. Um, so those issues are, are still being worked out, but uh, there will be buses. Um, and we're hoping we have adequate fleet capacity to be able to provide um, everyone um, who needs uh, transportation uh, with that option. Our next question, um, how are you going to help the seniors with uh, prepping for the, their schooling the next year? So when they move on from Shawshine, so we will still be having the guidance department, you know, work with students in the ways that they have in the past. Um, I imagine this question is getting at the seniors who won't be in the building because they'll be uh, out on co-op during shock week and remote during academic. And so, you know, through teams, guidance counselors can set up remote meetings with students and help them with that process. Um, if we needed to for any individual student who needed a little bit more to schedule an appointment for them to come in the building, we could. And so we are looking to still provide all of that support that we normally would. So great question. Uh, this next question, I'll, I'll start the response, Dr. Jackson, then I'll ask you to jump in. So the question is, as a parent, am I able to log in at any time to see what is being taught? So in terms of the Microsoft team class where it's a, a video class experience with uh, staff and student, um, just like it wouldn't be appropriate for a, 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 t a parent to like pop into the chemistry classroom and, and you know watch all the students, um, parents aren't going to have logons to log in to the, to the team class meeting um, with teachers and their students. It's the, the students who should be logging in on the video with the students. Um, Dr. Jackson, I don't know if you want to add anything to that response. Oh, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, you'd think we'd get this down by now. The, uh, the, the issue uh, that I think is extremely important is the, uh, the issue of student privacy and um, students need to feel comfortable that they are in as close to a classroom environment as possible. And part of learning is the ability to uh, feel safe um, to make mistakes and to say things that, um, that show a, a building understanding of a concept with a, a, and trusting that the people, that your classmates um, support that and understand that. So we are seeking the, uh, we want to maintain the privacy of the classroom for that reason. We'll be asking students to wear headphones so that, um, so that the noise, for the, so that the class itself, because obviously um, it, there may not be, they may be in a common room in your house, um, but that we're, so we we are looking for the privacy of the classroom to main to be maintained, um, and so um, we we consider that very important. We think it's important for your student, um, and um, um, that uh, we maintain that privacy. So we're asking that parents um, uh, they certainly can look at their students' work and. Um, have have their student go through their Microsoft Teams um, uh, account to uh, look at um, uh, assignments that are due and help their student time manage from that perspective. But participating in lot participating or eavesdropping on 
live um, live class sessions is is discouraged. Our next question. What will the shop week schedule look like? Will the kids stay in their shop all day, including lunch, or will they have access to the school overall? So for the most part, students will stay in their shop. Um, if shops have bathrooms within them, students will use those bathrooms um, to avoid, you know, more student interaction in the halls. Students will go to lunch. We're going to have uh, a lunchroom and the gym set up for the students to properly socially distance. They have to be over six feet away when eating because masks will be off. Um, we're going to be moving towards, you know, more of a box lunch style. We can't have the buffet situation. Um, to just keep that as safe as possible. Um, in terms of accessing other things in the school, you know, we're building a procedures for how a student could access guidance if they need to, or how a student could access the dean's office if they need to, just to do that safely. You know, we need those offices to have a heads up that things are happening. Um, so we definitely will, not that we, you know, we, at Shashin, we're lucky, we, we don't have a lot of hall roaming problems, things run run smoothly, um, but we're going to have to be even tighter just to not have um, those extra cases of interaction. So our next question, what happens if a student has questions and is not asking because of their anxiety? I think this is a great question. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, this occurs in the face to face classroom already. So it's something that we have strategies to address just in terms of, you know, teachers inquiring one-on-one um, -on -one with that student, you know, what's going on with them not participating, um, if that student confides in their guidance counselor and they can come to the teacher. I always encourage parents because oftentimes uh, they'll let you know that you reach out if that's the case with your student. Um, the other layer we're adding into this, you know, we have the 10 days with staff before they come back in and at least two of the outside uh, presenters we're bringing in are uh, respected experts on this topic um, and they will be giving our staff strategies for how to support students. Um, one is specifically on anxiety with students and another is around trauma-informed practices because we recognize that more so than during normal times, um, we'll need to be aware and be proactive about these needs. So thank you for asking. So next question, are you going to start now thinking about how to give seniors their prom, graduation, et cetera? It was such a disaster for last year's seniors. Um, you know, I, I will be fully transparent in this moment. I am not thinking about June. Um, I, I will get to that point. Dr. Jackson, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, well, I guess I, I, I uh, I guess the only point I'd like to make is uh, this is an important issue that we all eventually do need to address. Um, I think we uh, have no idea what June is going to look like. Um, and the other thing I guess I'd like to say is um, while I um, while I respect this parent's uh, point of view about it being a disaster and since I wasn't a superintendent here um, back in June, I can tell you that um, the process and the uh, the issues that Shashin faced, I faced in the school district where I worked and every superintendent in Massachusetts and principal in Massachusetts faced um, and um, that without a doubt everyone did the best with what they could. Um, the, the um, and so um, I um, I think this is an issue that will need to be addressed depending on the where the um, the, the situation is with COVID-19 at the time. But um, at this point in time, our focus is almost exclusively on reopening schools safely. So our next question. Is there training for staff and students for how to keep everyone as safe as possible? Uh, many places are training their staff, but I'm also concerned with training students how to act and do while they're in school. So it's a great question. Um, we have a, a couple approaches that we're going to take. So staff, you know, will be training when they're in the building next week. 
uh, we will be getting out, you know, information um, and hosting some events for staff and parents before they come into the building. But we recognize that until um, students are engaged in school, um, they may not opt into those events. So one of the things that we will be doing um, the first hour on the first day of class, September 14th, um, we're still working out the details and we'll share this, um, but having um, you know, an all school meeting that I'll run that students remotely will connect to from home, students in the building um, will have it projected for the rooms that, that we're in to go through those safety procedures. And then in shop at the start of each week, um, you know, the first time 11th graders are in, the first time 10 and 12, and then every time 9th graders go to a new shop, they always start with reviewing safety in the shop environment. And this is going to be a major topic because the specific safety training is going to differ in every single shop environment. So we'll get that blanket training out with the whole school um, and then follow up with that. That's a great question. So how will freshmen choose the shop that they want? Um, we will, now that we have uh, pieces about the fall flushed out, we will be scheduling our typical freshman orientation um, as a live event um, in the coming weeks. We'll get that information out to you. Um, and so I don't want to go too deep into it here, but basically um, after students go through the exploratory process, um, they choose their top choices for shop and then if there are enough spaces for all the students who choose, they get into that shop. If more students choose the shop, then there's room. Um, and then we go by student performance in the shop um, by their grades. And then we look at the second or third choices with the students. Um, so that's the short answer. And we will be hosting more forums to dive deeper into that. So hopefully that was helpful. So what is the plan if COVID infections rise and the governor closes in-person school? Another way of saying it is, what is the plan B for students who are attending in-person shop weeks and then have to transition into complete remote instruction? So this is a great question. So part of what our vocational staff will be doing when they're in for the 10 days, uh, the primary thing is getting their spaces ready to safely bring students in. We do have to alter those spaces and we're able to do some of that without the teachers, but they really have to get into the nitty gritty to make it align with their um, instructional practices. The other thing we're going to have them be looking at is starting to brainstorm and do some planning around should we have to make that pivot what it looks like. And I think I mentioned earlier that could involve some learning platforms that work for some shops and it might be um, you know teacher created projects for students in other shops for students that are learning but in the close contact trades will in-person learning include student act access to personal protective equipment so we will be working, and Brad, let me know if you want to jump in on this. So the one thing about the close contact trades is there's specific DESE guidance in each one for what students can and cannot do. So for instance, in culinary, we cannot run a restaurant with outside guests. So students wouldn't be coming into contact with those people. Um, but there are options, and we're still sorting them out for, you know, in-person, lunches for staff or box curbside pickup lunches. Um, we are requiring students to have their own masks um, for, you know, some students where, where face shields might be necessary. We put in the plan that you would reach out to us, uh, the nurse's office, if there's a medical reason for that. Uh, Dr. Jackson, do you want to speak any more to that question? Okay. Yeah, I that, that kind of Great. So next question, uh, do you feel 10 days is enough time for the staff for training? Um, I am grateful for the 10 days. I think it's a, a great amount of time. I think we will do well with it to, to speak honestly, to fully train educators to completely revamp their instruction in any field. If you think about how long you go to school to learn to be a teacher, anyone would always always take more time, right? Um, but I think the governor rightfully so had to balance that with how much time do we want to take away from instruction. So um, 
we are grateful for the 10 days. Will the kids have to wear masks for the whole day? Um, aside from lunch, yes, they will have to leave their masks on. Sorry, having a little trouble finding the next question. Okay, so are we, um, I will turn this to you, Dr. Jackson. Are we aiming toward getting all students face to face at all this school year? Um, there is nothing, there's nothing we would like more. Um, at this point in time, um, unless and until the physical distancing requirements of, um, are relaxed, um, then we just simply do not have the physical capacity to be able to have all of our Shashin students and staff in the building at the same time and maintain um, the even the minimal physical distancing um, capacities. We have a half, uh, at least a half a dozen shops where that is not possible. Um, we are able to accommodate those shops when academics are not in the building by taking over some academic space so that some of for um, so that the students um, who are uh, can can work in those spaces as well. But when all of our spaces are used, which would be when all four grades are here, um, unless and until the physical distancing requirements are relaxed, um, hybrid will be the best uh, solution we can offer. So our next question, <clears throat> can Microsoft Teams be more interactive like Zoom or Google Hangouts where students can ask questions verbally and teachers can respond? So Microsoft Teams does uh, have that option, so students can interact verbally with the teacher. And one of the um, changes they're making that should be into effect soon is teachers can even like make breakout rooms in Teams, similar to like how students might work as a group in class, and then the teacher can check in with each group. So Microsoft Teams does have a, a number of features that maybe under the um, emergency remote, remote learning of the spring uh, that you did not see. So we're excited about that. Yes, if I could just add what they may be, what may be prompted this question is um, the fact that this session is not, does not have that feature. Um, this is, we're using Microsoft Live. Is that right? This is a, a yeah. different than Microsoft Teams. So um, this, this um, does not have that feature, but uh, Microsoft Teams does. So I just wanted to clarify any, confusion that uh, that might cause. So our next question, what are you going to do for students who are seniors this year? These kids already lost spring sports as juniors and now potentially will lose fall and winter. Are there plans to make it so they don't lose their entire year? Um, that is something that we're going to be looking at as we dive into the guidance from the MIAA. Uh, but what's beyond our control, you know, is if they they shut down seasons like they had to do at one point last year. Do you want to add anything to that? No, I I think um, um, I I empathize and um, with this parent's concern, but um, ultimately, uh, you know, these decisions are being made for safety, and if we if school sports or any school activity cannot be run safely, it's not going to be run. Next question is, are these decisions for just fall semester or for the entire school year? Um, they are until something changes that requires us to pivot either to full remote, do it to not being safety, or um, if COVID is alleviated and we're able to bring back kids back in. So as long as it needs to be the decision, I know that that's not an ideal answer, but it's the situation we have. Next question, will Teams be used for schoolwork, assignment and submission, or will Google Classroom also be used? Um, we are using Microsoft tools. Um, so for consistency, uh, Google will not be used. 
So what if a child or a student is out sick? What is the policy and procedures to return? So if a student um, or staff or anyone is out sick due to um, suspected symptoms or to being diagnosed or a close contact, uh, in the, our fall reopening plan, we have a chart uh, directly from the Department of Ed on the protocols to be followed. So if a student's symptomatic, I believe it says, um, you know, with a, with a negative test or so many days, and that is outlined pretty specifically there. Um, do you want to add anything to that, Dr. Jackson? No, the, the, we will be following um, uh, mass, uh, not only the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed guidelines, but the Massachusetts Department of Public Health guidelines for students um, or staff members um, who are either sick um, or have uh, or have a um, um, have been quarantined due to being in close proximity to a um, um, to a uh, family member or someone else who um, either t who has tested positive. Those will be followed um, explicitly, and um, um, they we will be working through the local boards of health in the town where you live and coordinating that work with our um, school nurses office and the administrative offices to ensure that students are able to come back to school as soon as they um, either have a negative test or have quarantined for the required number of days. So our next question, um, will there still be an option for juniors and seniors to take Spanish this year? And so, uh, yes, we had the, the summer Spanish, we have in-school Spanish, and then I imagine this question is getting at for students who wanted to do an after-school Spanish option. Um, that is something that we will be revisiting um, and planning once we have sort of the, the reopening uh, procedures ready and kids safely in the building. Um, so we will be following up on that information. This next question, just because there's a lag in me getting to the questions due to the number, uh, I think is referring back to something we talked about a while ago. So are you basing these comments on what could come out of the State Department of Education, or is this a possibility for Shawshank Tech to do this alone based on an outbreak in a particular shop? So I'm guessing this question was based on any decision to move to remote, um, which if there is an outbreak in a particular, so yes, and, and Dr. Jackson, feel free to jump in. If there is an outbreak at Shawsheen, like we have the potential to go full remote without the entire state doing it. Um, and the nice thing about our cohorting, you know, if something happens in a contained shop area, we we may only have to send students home from that area. But again, that depends on how it aligns with the parameters put in place for, you know, if someone who is diagnosed comes in contact with people of this many feet. Um, those guidelines would help us figure that out. I do not know the answer to this one, Dr. Jackson. The next question is, when will the pool be open? Um, nor do I. Uh, at this point in time, we, um, since it's not um, directly um, related to the reopening of school, um, we have... Um, um, you know, we've kind of triaged some of those other issues. Um, I can tell you that um, it, if it will require us to take essential personnel away, uh, particularly cleaning um, or support personnel away from duties that keep um, students safe or that uh, to do the cleaning, um, then um, it will, uh, then, no, then those issues will be prioritized. So um, opening the pool um, is not our highest priority at this point in time. So our next question is about parking passes. Will students share a parking spot? And if we do go back in person, who gets to keep the parking spot? Mm -hmm. um, and so in the event we're able to go back in person. Um, that would mean that we can fit kids on, that would be a situation where like COVID's really good and we can fit people on buses, we can put them in classes. So in that instance, we would default to give it, give priority to seniors. 
but there would still be some section of juniors who could who could keep their spot. So is there no basketball? Would there possibly be a drills and skills type program with limitations for those athletes? Again, um, I, I think everything from us on athletics is to be determined at this point. So how is arrival, dismissal, and lunch being handled? with distancing guidelines? So that's a great question. So we are working out some procedures um, that we've been walking through for timing, arrival, and drop off at um, different locations. And so identifying based on where the student is reporting um, uh, that day, where they would go to, um, go to enter the building, whether it's through a shop door, or um, the main entrance or the cafeteria entrance, we're looking to time um, the bus drop off as well. And so instead of a traditional homeroom period, we'll be assigning students to trickle in between 725 and 750 and going straight to their first period classes. And so really making it so that there's not um, students running into each other with dismissal similarly, um staging and and maybe starting to dismissal a couple minutes early every minute uh releasing a few classrooms and shops at a time designating doors of exit um to prevent you know that cross traffic with large groups um and with lunch as well just having you know entrance and exit doors um you know not releasing like the, if you're familiar with the building the entire construction cluster is in the same hallway right so we're not going to release that same hallway into the same lunch at the same time. We'll spread them out over five lunches. So working on a lot of procedures like that. So the question is the band program still going to happen? And if so, how is that going to look? Um, we don't currently have a band program at Shawshine. How will ninth grade exploratory work for shops that are not able to be held on site? So that's something that's currently in the works. Um, like I, I spoke about with vocational departments working for those alternative plans. So a lot of questions coming in about if students will be required to use their videos during Microsoft Teams. Um, yes, we're going to have them use their video to connect and see their classmates. Um, there are options, you know, for students to use alternative backgrounds when they are presenting in Teams. And um, there are also ways for um, us to manage behavior through like a code of conduct and some training that we'll do as well. So I do hear the concerns about that. Um, but those are things that we're working on to structure. So how will you accommodate students with 504s? Um, Mr. Bayonne, our Director of Guidance, will continue to um, do that process as normal, meeting with teachers um, and, uh, and parents at meetings and making any alterations that need to happen. So a question, how can I get my son on the list of the kids who did not do well at all last year as a high need student? Um, so again, we're, we are constructing those lists uh, based on the feedback that we had and then we'll be reaching out to parents. So will there be info coming out with bus locations, times, and pickups? Uh, yes, but we will need a little additional time to publish that just based on feedback um, from when students, uh, from which students do need access to the bus and things of that nature, but that will be coming out. So this next question is about um, if teachers will be proactive with parents and reach out about students missing assignments. Um, yes, we're gonna have multiple layers to that. You know, teachers will be expected to communicate with parents 
um, guidance council will be working on guidance will be working on systems to help aid in that communication um, and all parents will have access to Aspen and be able to log in um, and see if students are um, are turning in their assignments or not. So not a question about attendance since it will be taken, but what if there are home IT internet issues? Can they make up the work and gain attendance credit? Yeah, we inevitably are going to have days where a student has a connection issue, and so we're going to um, have to be flexible and handle those on a case by case basis. So our goal here isn't to say you had an IT issue, you fail. Um, so we will be we will be uh, thoughtful with how we handle that. So I'm just looking through uh, questions and trying to, a lot of them have already been answered. So give me a moment here. Will students be allowed to touch each other as in hugs and high fives in school? Um, nope, because they have to maintain at least three feet, feet of distance from one another. So that will not be allowed. So can you share the details around ninth grade orientation? Yes. So, um, you know, our typical ninth grade orientation has a lot of team building and interactive physical activities, uh, a lot of group gathering and things of those nature, which just are not feasible or safe. So what we are doing um, with the ninth graders is, again, we're going to have some of these um, live sessions available leading up to the week where school starts. Um, students will participate in that school-wide video and get, you know, the information that everyone is getting. And then we're really drilling the orientation piece down to um, the technology needs of students because that's going to be the biggest piece on the academic side. You know, on the shop side, they, since they're exploring a different shop every week, the first day is like an orientation to every shop already. So that will happen. Uh, but they, during their first exploratory cycle, will uh, in small groups be pulled out for roughly two hours um, to get set up on our system so that when they go into their next academic week or their first academic week, um, they will be able to, um, they will be able to uh, su engage successfully, excuse me. So when will the incoming ninth grade students find out where they have been placed from the English and math assessments. Uh, I will talk to uh, the assistant principal's office about um, how and when that information will be shared. Thank you. Uh, Brad, this is a sanitizing question that I'll throw to you. Who will be sanitizing railings and doors three times a day? Our, our, um, our in-house custodial staff will be, um, will be there with sports. So another question, will co-op still be a choice for upperclassmen? Yes. Um, the the juniors uh, are not allowed to to start early. That is always a, a fourth quarter option for them. But eligible students who have eligible placements uh, still have co-op as an option. Another question, how many students will be in one class? Um, that differs based on the course type, um, you know, whether it's an elective or a concurrent enrollment course or an honors, a CP, um, as well as the various levels um, or if it's a support services level course. So, you know, on the support services end, it could be, you know, eight students, other class typically uh, between like 10 and 22. We do have some classes that are a little bigger than that might hit 25, 26. Uh, but we're working to try and uh, make those as even as possible for our teachers to have, you know, equitable and manageable levels of students for this remote learning piece. So next question, will shops be limited to how many students can be assigned to that shop? Um, so in terms of week to week, 
uh, students, we had already taken that into account when we uh, made a decision to move to this plan. We looked at the numbers in the shops and if we could do 100% vocational. So no student who's in a shop is going to be kicked out of a shop. So uh, I think this one's for you, Bad Brad. So please clarify the students are now expected to provide the additional COVID cleaning within the shop. Um, the person is concerned about this. So when for shared equipment, um, it's logistically not possible for um, anyone but the student to be able to provide to be able to do the cleaning of the equipment um, between uses. So um, if you're sharing a power drill uh, between two students, um, those two students will be required to uh, to observe to um, to sanitize it between uses. So next question I'll give to you as well, Brad, will the buses be able to support the same routes given the new guidelines or will families need to drive their student? So I, I, at this point in time, we don't have a lot of um, details that we're able to provide about transportation. And I understand that is making everyone nervous. Um, I, uh, we are, our goal is to run, uh, so let me let me back up a little bit. I can't imagine that the bus routes will change, uh, but I um, because they um, um, because we're planning on using the same number of buses, and uh, um, you know this is this isn't kindergarten. We're not picking up kids at their uh, at their doorstep, so. Um, I um, I don't think there'll be a big change in terms of bus routes. Um, we haven't run the final numbers to make sure we have enough capacity. If we are running out of capacity, we will um, you know we will contact bus ride bus riders and um, see what alternatives we may be able to provide. Normally, we would just um, you know, if this were a problem, we would consider adding buses. But um, the our bus vendor has uh, is is um, has indicated that they um, don't have any excess capacity uh, during the hours that we need them. Uh, so at this point in time, we're going to have to make do with the fleet that we have. Just sorting our question here. Next, uh, Brad, if you want to take this one as well, would there be mask breaks for students? Um, we have um, this. We don't have. We have not finally come down on a final decision on this. But our current thinking is, um, outside of lunch, the answer is no. Um, we. Um, there are very specific protocols that need to be followed for students to enter a mask break area, for students to be distanced during a mask, during their mask breaks, for students to be um, uh, supervised during mask breaks, and for students uh, to be to return from mask breaks um, and follow proper sanitizing rules and. Um, at this point in time, um, we um, we we are we're not focusing our um, our capacity, our our human capacity, on staffing that um, that alternative. Next question: How will students be able to take tests? Um, there are different programs uh, within Microsoft that um, staff can utilize to give various types of assessments, and we will be giving staff some training on that during the next 10 days. 
Another question that has been asked in a number of different ways, it seems there's a little bit of confusion as to um, which days students will be um, in shop versus academic at the start of the school year. So the calendar online is updated the first week of school, uh, 9 and 11 will be in school for shop and 10 and 12 will be academic. It switches the next week. And then another question was, you know, if your ninth grader goes to one shop the first week of school, will they go to a different shop two weeks later? And yes, they will. Um, through the spring, every week when ninth graders go to a shop, they will go to a different one each time. They will explore um, each shop one at a time. So this one um, is for you, Dr. Jackson. I'm concerned with the fumes and harsh effects of all these cleaning and sanitizing products. I've gotten nauseous at work myself and I have to take breaks outside. Will you have any electric shock sanitizers? I'm not familiar with that term. We are going to be use, using um, after school, we, we do have um, um, room-based sanitizers that um, that do um, um, that do sanitize entire rooms um, and that um, fall on to, and contact and they'll be done during the time when the school is empty. Um, and but um, I'm not familiar with that term exactly. The, what was that term again, Jeff? Um, sorry. That question. Oh, we delete it. That's okay. We'll look back. I'll, I'll look that up. I, I, I'm not going to look it up now, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm writing it down. So I, um, we um, have it saved in the chat. We have Thank it saved in the chat, which we can download. So another question was about, um, it will we be updating our attendance policy due to COVID? Um, so one of the pieces that we will be updating around validated absences. And so um, in order to have a medical validated absence, historically at Shawshank, you have had uh, to meet a doctor to say they saw you in the office that day. Um, that will be changing under this because if you are exposed to someone, um, your doctor is actually not going to ask you to come into the office. They're going to tell you to quarantine for however many days. And so, um, you know, we will be modifying the note will have to say that they were seen in person. And so that'll be a part of the updated um, sections of the student handbook that we share. Next question, will there be health professionals, uh, school nurse on site monitoring and addressing concerns about the health of the school population? For example, a student is exhibiting signs of illness, coughing, etc. Um, we will have school nurses here um, doing what they normally do. We will also have a designated space for students with COVID symptoms um, that the nurse's office will staff um, and be monitoring uh, what goes on with those students who are exhibiting uh, symptoms. Dr. Jackson, would you like to add anything to that? Actually, I, 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 I would please just for a moment. I, I will actually, this somewhat circles back to the attendance policy. Um, uh, as well, this this year requires flexibility on a lot of folks' behalf, and one of the groups that needs to be flexible is us. And um, we are asking parents if their children are not feeling well to not send them to school, even if they think it's a cold, or until they are sure. We're asking them to not send them to school. Um, so it is in a it, it's not reasonable for us to expect um, doctor's notes um, at some time. So I think part of this part of the issues we have to deal with and be ready for is um, that we are going to have to adjust some of our practices as we ask parents to adjust there. So I think the issue about being um, about being cognizant of one's own personal well-being and health is really important. Um, and we are asking staff to do that. 
and we're asking students and parents of students to do that as well. So our next question, if a student comes down with COVID, how will makeup work be assigned, when due, et cetera? Um, we will handle that similar to how in the past, you know, when students have come down sick with other viruses or um, have ha they had to be hospitalized, you know, we, we provide extended time. We work with the student to get them back on track. Um, you know, if it's a situation where uh, the student comes down with COVID but is asymptomatic and is fine to engage remotely from home. You know, we're already set up that way in the academic side. Um, we can work on the shop side as well. Um, so there's some flexibility there as well. So we will have plans in place for that. So next question, my child participate in the MCAS summer help using Microsoft Teams. We experience technical problems using Microsoft Teams, such as not being able to hear the teacher. What do we do if this happens? What if a student misses an entire day of instruction in this class due to technical problems? So we have a couple layers to this. Um, the first would be, you know, what I spoke about, about getting information and tutorials out to parents um, to, and students to help support using um, and accessing uh, Teams and using the school devices, um, teachers, in teams can help students troubleshoot the the school devices we're going to give them some training on on how to do that and then we can also give you access to um, the same uh, ed tech email address we've been using at Shawshine that we used in the last closure to reach out to if you're having issues um, and so we have a, a couple of supports there that we can build in so thank you for your question can i um, add something to that just for seconds of course um a, a little tip that um, I think ma many parents learned um, and I learned as a when I was working remotely is that um, sometimes some issues can be caused by your local um, wireless um, uh, 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 adapter on your um, cable um, it just doesn't have the throughput to handle a lot of devices. Um, and um, so a lot of folks that I, um, a lot of folks that I knew who were having this trouble um, did things like disconnecting their Roku uh, during a time when a student, uh, during the school day, or um, there, are, so there are a lot of devices um, that we don't even remember are accessing our wireless um, hub in our, in our homes. Um, many phones are doing the same thing, accessing the wireless hub. And if a student, um, you have two students, one's writing and is listening to some, their Spotify playlist, um, and both of those things can be going through the wireless uh, adapter at the same time. So um, one way, if you are addressing some intermittent problems or connectivity issues is to really try to um, minimize the number of devices that you have connected at one time to your wireless. And that's the and that's the last tech advice you're ever going to get from me, I promise. So our next uh our next question, I anticipate a larger pool of students being driven or dropped off. Will you change the procedure as picking up in front of the building may not be a good system still? Yeah, one of the things that we're working out with those plans is how to how to navigate traffic. We actually had a lively discussion about um, directing traffic this morning, so we will be working on that. Thank you. If students can't use lockers, where will they keep their tools? Would they be expected to bring home every day? Um, you know, as a general rule, we're not allowing students to use lockers. If there are students in shops, that we are allowing shop lockers with some procedures in place. Um, if there's a situation where there's any shop that there aren't shop lockers and students need to secure tools, we can come up with procedures because the hall lockers are outside the shop, any given shop. We can come up with procedures for that. So that's something that we can work with. A great question. Another question is about what's going to happen with MCAS for students that it didn't take it last year. Um, so the last I had heard 
is that they were planning to move forward with at least math and English sometime this year for students that didn't take it last year. Um, I don't know if you are privy to any updates beyond that, Dr. Jackson. Um, every time we ask the commissioner um, in our weekly, um, although I just missed one today, but our weekly conference calls, um, he, um, he, he is insisting that MCAS is going on as scheduled. Um, what that means for our current junior or our rising juniors who missed it in um, their sophomore year um, is unclear. Desi has not offered us anything, whether they're thinking about doing it in the fall, whether they're going to wait and do two grades in the spring, if possible. Um, they, uh, we are not, been, have not been provided with any guidance at all. Um, so unfortunately, we just don't have any answers to those questions. Our next question is how will we return books that we still have from the following school year um, and will and how we get the books we need for this year. So um, in the principles update Monday and I'll and I know everyone doesn't have time to read those. So um, I, I totally get it and we'll be sending this reminder a couple times. Um, it outlined that when students come to take their photos um, grades 10 through 12, they will also return their books at that time in the gym. A process is outlined for how that will happen safely. Um, they will also be able to pick up parking passes on that date and the laptops they are signing out. And then we're going to, um, after those books have sat long enough, because we know COVID only lives, you know, for so many days on surfaces, um, that those will be able to sit for about two weeks we will then be they'll be ready to redistribute to other students where needed to redistribute um, so we'll continue to send out reminders about that another question about email addresses for ninth graders yes ninth graders will get school email addresses when they are in during that first shop week is when during their technology orientation they will log into all their school accounts for the first time So uh, next question in regards to freshman exploratory, will there be any alterations to the amount of time spent in any of the shops? Um, right now, our plan is for them to spend one week in each shop. So unless things change with the, with the COVID situation. So another question um, starts out with excellent forum. Thank you, you're welcome. Um, I may have missed this, but is there a specific type of mask that's required? Uh, so, Students have to wear a mask or face covering that fully covers their nose and their mouth. Um, to my knowledge, there are no more specifics beyond that. Um, and so just make sure that they're adequate in that way. One plug I will put out there, um, there are these like see-through like shields that just sort of go in front of the face but don't connect it all. Some uh, parents had asked about those. Those are more for like food service pre-COVID. Those wouldn't work because there isn't any closure to them. I um, can I also add to that. Um, there's been some talk, although it hasn't been formalized yet from Desi, that um, kerchiefs and um, what do they call those things that kind of look like cowls kind of. Um, gators. Gators um, may not um, make it through the um, May, may be uh, considered inappropriate by the time we get back to school, uh, meaning there may be some additional guidance coming from DESE that um, is suggesting that those, uh, those are not adequate. There's some emerging um, research about gators particularly that um, um, is causing DESE to, to, uh, to reconsider some of those guidelines. So another question is about lockdown drills and fire drills. Um, you know, we, I assume, because I haven't heard otherwise, that the fire department um, will still be coming in to do fire drills. I don't know if you've heard um, anything differently, Dr. Jackson. Um, 
in terms of lockdown drills, um, we'll be holding those off for the start of the school year because um, until we can get a better grasp on how we could actually run a lockdown drill safely due to the fact that part of the drill involves students barricading and moving things in rooms. So um, I, I don't, those are not going to be happening early on in the school year because we can't do them safely. Um, we will, however, be um, making sure, particularly our incoming freshmen are aware of all of our emergency procedures during their um, the time when we are sharing um, all of our uh, um, safety, uh, other safety protocols with them. So um, we will make sure that all of our students, particularly those who are new to the building, um, are aware of all of our standing safety procedures, particularly around fire drills and around intruder alerts and, uh, and, um, and what to do in those uh, circumstances. So we have a couple questions about school hours. Um, and so students who are remote, you know, need to be logged in at 750 for their first period class. Um, and eighth period will end at 204 like it typically does. And then for students in school, you know, there'll be a window between 725 and 750 for them to do a staggered entry. Um, and then they'll be in school until 204. So the only difference is not having um, students in homeroom by 730. How will students and parents be notified if there are any positive COVID cases in the school? Can you speak to that one, Dr. Jackson? The, uh, the notification process, um, we all um, staff and students who um, have been determined to have been in close proximity to a um, person who has tested positive or is presumed positive will be notified, all others will not. So next question, um, how do I find out what the curriculum is being taught? Um, so, you know, teachers will have classroom management plans that they share um, with students that will have the overview of their their course descriptions and objectives. So those will be given out for each course. Next question, should freshmen bring their laptops to school the first week to get set up? Uh, students don't need to bring those in. Every program that students will be accessing can be accessed through a web browser. Um, so there's nothing that students need to download on their devices, so they do not need to bring devices to school that first week. Dr. Jackson, if you'll address this one, um, will you be taking temperature every morning during shop? Uh, no, we will not. Temperature um, taking is not part of the protocol um, for a, either students or staff. Um, it has been determined by the experts that there are too many false positives um, that uh, uh, that and um, that um, it's not an effective way to um, uh, to screen. Another question for you, Dr. Jackson, are students and staff required to be tested prior to the start of school? No, they are not. Another question for you. Will there be a school committee meeting before school opens to discuss reopening? Uh, I have not had that conversation with the school committee chair um, as of yet. Another question. What if a student simply has a cold? Um, will they? Sorry, the question disappeared. Um, so what if a student has a cold um, and it's not COVID, how will that be handled? Well, our, uh, my suggestion is that the student, when the student is coming down with a cold, that they be out for that day to make sure that that's what's happening. Um, and if and when you make uh, the, uh, the family makes that determination, they should give our uh, school nurse a call to um, 
let them know um, and consult with our school nurse prior to returning to school. So there are a couple of questions coming in around uh, physical education and wearing masks and things of that nature. So physical education happens during the academic week, so students won't be um, in the building for that. And so the issue of like wearing masks or not for PE um, is, is not an issue. Um, in terms of how PE will be structured, students spend half the year doing um, the more physical side of PE and then half the year doing during the health side. Um, and so health will be taught, um, and we're still working on finalizing the PE because it has its own considerations, but health will be taught remotely similar to other academic classes. Um, phys ed may involve aspects where students are like given things to do um, physically and then report back to the teacher. Um, and then depending on um, you know, other factors that play with staffing, we may need to utilize uh, PE teachers in other ways as well. Uh, but there there's, doesn't need to be any concern about that physical interaction because it will remain on the academic week. So will homework be assigned in the usual manner? Um, so we will be talking with staff um, in our you know, curriculum planning sessions when they return just about um, being manageable with homework in relation to the, to the in-school activities because things are gonna be flipped around a little bit in some ways. Um, just, just being mindful of the, the sort of, I know they sometimes call it Zoom fatigue of being tied into uh, video all day long. And so, um, the, the amount and type might change a little bit, but any assignment of it would happen, you know, with, with teachers in the teams. So I think this speaks to, it was asked if, if, if parents are required to check a child's temperature every morning before school, um, that is not our requirement. We have Dr. Jackson, correct? For parents to check temperature. Parents are not required to check their child's temperature. This question is about notifying if a student is sick, do we call the school as we normally would? Yes, yeah, so you follow that same procedure and then um, follow up by either emailing or sending your student to school with any, any relevant notes or paperwork after the fact. That'll still be managed by uh, Ms. Heather Tate out of the Dean's office. Uh, will Mr. Albert, special education uh, director, have a similar form for parents? Um, you know, he is, is freshly new with us and he hit the ground running and he was talking to me the other day about some outreach to parents that he has planned. Uh, but rightfully so, you know, we need, we need time to get in and learn the building and how we're doing everything. But uh, he has already talked to me about his plans to connect with parents. So stay tuned for that. Dr. Jackson, I'm going to kick this one to you. Um, if there is a new rise in cases from one particular town, how does it play out for the rest of the students who may be in the same shop? Are the students being separated by town within a shop? Uh, students are not being separated uh, by town uh, within a shop. Um, if um, so, at this point in time, uh, we, if that were the case, we would ask we would continue to ask people to monitor their student um, and not send anyone to school who was not feeling who was feeling unwell. Obviously, if a student were ordered to uh, either undergo a COVID test by the local Board of Health or otherwise ordered to quarantine, we expect that to be uh, reported to the school and the student to remain out until they are cleared uh, to return. So next question is about if teachers are going to be required to update Aspen on a regular schedule so parents can see missing assignments. Um, yes, teachers are required to update Aspen on a regular schedule. Um, and if you are finding that, you know, for any given class, you're not seeing any any grades entered, um, you can reach out. You know, I would always start with the teacher first um, and then sort of go from there. If you if you need to reach out to one of the administrative offices, 
um, because it might just be, you know, a miscommunication or an error with Aspen. And if we find out it's not there, we'll, we'll make sure that those grades get posted. So will students be sent the new expectations for being in school before they come in or will they take place once students come into the building? No, um, oh well, no, that doesn't answer anything. You gave me two options. Um, students will and parents will be provided with expectations before students enter the building to make sure that they enter safely. And then um, certain expectations um, will be reiterated again once they're in the building and some will be dug into deeper when we are with them face to face. So we, we won't wait until they get here to get started on that. So based on the feedback from the parent survey, what percentage of students are you expecting to return? Um, on the shop week, based on responses so far, uh, most of them, overwhelmingly most of them. But it just sent out Monday, so there are still opportunities for people to opt out. Will masks be supplied to students from the school? Um, the short answer is no, the school will not, but we will have uh, backup masks available in case there's an issue where a student forgets theirs. Dr. Jackson, do you want to add to that? No, we'll, I mean, as as Ms. Cook said, we uh, will be providing uh, masks to students who um, um, on a, may, a rare occasion may forget theirs or if it breaks during uh, the day, but uh, we are expecting um, students uh, and families to provide families to provide their own students with their own masks. So another question has come in. Um, it is about dismissal policies. So we will be sharing those procedures once they are finalized, um, but we will be um, staggering dismissal just off by a couple minutes um, and assigning boards based on shops. Uh, Dr. Jackson, I'll, I'll kick this one to you. As far as snow days, uh, would kids be expected to still log on remotely if we are still in this model? Um, I don't have the answer to that question yet. Um, there has been some conversation by the commissioner that um, if we were in uh, remote, um, that snow days would not exist, so to speak. Um, and uh, but in the hybrid model, um, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Another question for you. Um, can you elaborate on the additional nurses office negative pressure isolation area and the location? Um, we have, oh, what's, I, we've, we have identified a space um, now that we, we have, uh, we had originally identified a space um, based on our original plan, uh, hybrid plan, um, and now that we um, have switched that plan so that it's all um, um, academics are all remote, we have taken over an academic space near the nurse's office um, that is going to be, um, that's actually um, has a door entrance from the nurse's office into this space. Um, and has um, um, and uh, can be accessed directly from the nurse's office without having to go out into the corridor. Um, so that um, space has been identified as being retrofitted for um, students or staff members who are um, um, who may be showing si signs or symptoms of COVID to rest while they're either awaiting pickup or, um, um, or uh, by themselves or a member of their family. Um, they, um, and that, um, that space is also, uh, we're reviewing our um, HVAC system to um, ensure that it is um, um, independently venting um, internal air to the outside and is not recirculating any of the air 
um, in that room to other parts of our building. Question is about the use of Aspen um, to post assignments since uh, parents don't always have the ability to go into Teams and look at that. Um, and so for them to see the assignments that have been posted, um, one of the things that we're looking in the back end with Teams, like if, if there is a parent view that they can use to help with that location. Um, so just know we are looking into ways um you know not having parents in the team's class but whether they can go and see uh what, what's due for students so that is something on our radar so thank you for bringing that up next question will there be opportunities for students to give feedback about their remote experiences for example if they're feeling there is too much screen time will that data be collected and acted upon thank you for asking this question you know with all of this um that we're going into we are going to continually need to assess um, and adjust what we are doing to make sure it is you know best supporting our students as learners um, obviously if academics are 100 percent remote because we can't safely fit students in the building um, an option isn't to say okay now they're going to come in the building part of the time um, i think what it's more likely to inform is how we then revisit pd and collaboration with teachers around how they're structuring the time that students are engaged in remote learning. It's like I said earlier, I don't want it to be like Sage on the stage, the teacher lecturing every period, every day, and the kids staring at it. Um, there needs to be a lot of um, instructional practices that are student-centered uh, so that they're not just staring at the screen and lecturing. So thank you for asking that. That's something that we're continually going to be assessing. It's definitely a priority for me as the principal. So for the back, let me let me add ask that add that to that as well, which is kind of, um, which kind of goes to this. Oh, Brad, you muted yourself. Uh, somebody there muted you know. me. Jeez, I hope it that's not me. a. It wasn't me. That, yeah, I hope that's not an editorial comment by anyone. Um, the, the next question is for a mass break question. How will mass work for students? Oh, no, that's that's the next one. That's the one above. For a student on an IP needs breaks, what will the options? Will students have breaks between video classes? So I really want to I really want to um, work on the word video classes. Um, if you think about what happens in an academic classroom, a teacher does not stand up in front of the class and talk to the class for 40 uh, for 40 or 45 minutes at a time and the students sit there dutifully listening and taking notes. There are times when teachers introduce material verbally um, and then ask students to discuss it in small groups. There are times when teachers introduce material and ask students to read something and then write a 10 minute reflection in their um, uh, in their notebook. So there are going to be times in the normal course of a um, of a class when a student does not necessarily have to be on um, um, attached to a video like this um, like this um, uh, almost two hour experience is now um, so um, the um, there are going to be breaks if you will for um, for students um, because we expect teachers to use a multiple multiple different um, instructional methods as they do in their in-class instruction um, to have students um, get exposed to, learn, and um, internalize the material. So um, I, I really, I think that's going to be the biggest kind of barrier in terms of understanding what's going on. There are going to be times when your student is sitting in front of their computer, um, but their um, their video isn't on, they're not listening because they're writing, because they're reading, um, 
that's what happens in classes and that's what is going to happen um, in online learning as well. Now you're muted, Jess. We're just taking turn being muted here. Um, has the this is for you, Dr. Jackson? Has board the Board of Health reviewed any of our plans? I was. Uh, I have not yet uh, had an opportunity to uh, finalize my uh, appointment with the uh, Bill Rick Board of Health. It's on my list. So another mask break question. Um, how will masks work for students with severe asthma that need a break? So, uh, I guess I'll I, I can my first point would be that um, students, uh, parents who have medical or students that have medical concerns about masks um, should consult with the school nurse um, and we can see if we can find accommodation ways to accommodate those medical needs. Um, students who um, have asthma um, aren't necessarily um, uh, you know, their masks don't necessarily, it depends what triggers their asthma. Um, masks don't necessarily trigger asthma. So um, that would be something that would have to be addressed on a case by case basis with the school nurse. So, next question If a freshman is feeling sick during shop week and they have to miss school, will they be able to jump on remotely for shop that day? Um, chances are no, just because for the, the shop to the activities that go on in shop um, and to suddenly have to, to pivot one day with one teacher of record getting everything online, that's not feasible. Um, but that is one of the reasons, and this answers another question up there about the number of shops students go through. That is the reason instead of our traditional 12 shop exploratory cycle, we're extending it to 14 or 15. So let's say your child gets sick during their favorite shop that they wanna be in and they're out for two or three days. Um, we would then have the flexibility down the road to allow your students to re-explore that shop. The option that won't exist, and not every student can say, you know, hey, I love that shop, I want to re-explore it. Um, no, you always have to go through new ones. But if you miss student illness, it allows us that flexibility. Another question, if a child has seasonal allergies, how will that be handled? If a student coughs or sneezes, Will they be instructed to stay home? So I can start and then see if uh, Dr. Jackson wants to elaborate. So based on the list um, of reasons why people shouldn't come into the building, um, having you know a sneezing or running nose um, is or allergy symptoms in general are listed, and it says in parentheses next to some of them, unless caused by other known um, things such as allergies. Uh, some of those symptoms also say, you know, in conjunction with other sim symptoms. So if, if you know what it's about and that conversation, you know, might happen with the nurse as well, um, it won't be an automatic getting sent home. Did you want to add anything to that? No, again, I, I guess. I guess the uh, uh, the school nurse plays an important role in all this, and I think if a student is experiencing, uh, you know, seasonal allergies, um, you know, or um, um, or just a plain old sneezing fit from because dust or something, uh, you know, they're not going to be, uh, you know, wrapped in plastic and and um, thrown into a, 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 a negatively pressured room. So um, we we. Uh, you know, we want to be careful, uh, but these are um, uh, children and young adults, and uh, we uh, want to. We will treat them with respect, um, and uh, everybody knows their um, their bodies. And when they're starting to not feel well, um, most people who have seasonal allergies are pretty good at being able to figure out whether they're experiencing seasonal allergy um, symptoms or uh, or there's a cold, they have a cold coming on. Another question for you, Dr. Jackson, is the school covering COVID tests if required by the school? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I, um, I, 
I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to contact, contact I, that will be one of the questions I asked the uh, Bill Ricker Board of Health. So two questions have just come in related to whether or not students will be able to work in partners or in groups while in shop. Um, if they can work together safely at least three feet apart with masks on, uh, then yes, they could work on something. Um, but if it were something that required them to be in close proximity, then no. Um, so, so that's the, the general specific answer there. Not general specific, that's the, that's the answer there. Um, next question, will there be a designated space for students or staff with anxiety that need a break? So students will, um, you know, following the procedures we put in place for safe movement in the school, you know, be able to access um, guidance counselors if they need to or other support staff. Um, we haven't talked about designating a specific space for that. Otherwise, Dr. Jackson, would you like to elaborate at all? Um, I think it's important for students to feel comfortable in school and I think it is that we will be seeing students who are exhibiting symptoms of anxiety um, and um, we sh they should feel they can go to a trusted adult, say I'm getting kind of anxious um, and be able to either go to guidance, see our school psychologist or some other trusted adult and we can find a place um, for them to chill and relax and to refocus. Um, um, to me, this is a really critical piece of this. Um, we haven't talked a lot about it, about this during this uh, past two hours, but uh, Ms. Cook and I uh, have been very, very focused on student social emotional wellness um, and managing that during these uh, this time. Uh, and during this reentry period, recognizing that anxiety will be higher um, among some of our students and among some of our staff, and that we need to uh, be flexible and, and understanding and manage that. So um, that is an area that I personally take uh, a high, uh, fo I focus on very, very, um, at a very high level. Uh, because I think it's very important that students feel safe in school. And part of that is having the ability to go to a trusted adult and say, I'm feeling a little, uh, my anxiety is getting, uh, getting ahead of me right now. So our next question, will after school clubs still be a thing? Would they be in person? Um, we recognize the value of clubs and activities and we are working out um, how we would structure that, um, potentially offering them remote. So more information will be forthcoming um, on those opportunities. And next question, when will the students be introduced to their guidance counselors? So at the moment, um, students in 11 and 12 have the same guidance counselors as last year because they're shop based. Um, students move, who are in permanent shops um, moving into 10th grade, if they didn't get, because they were only, I believe, in one week of their permanent shops last year before we shut down. So since guidance counselors are assigned by shop, when those students are in school, guidance counselors will be able to go around and introduce themselves. And then freshman guidance counselors are split up by last name. Um, so the guidance department will, um, you know, in their meetings over the coming weeks, figure out strategies for, for how to do that and work with their students and um, leverage time when students in the building, but there will also be ways for guidance counselors to connect remotely with students. So um, students definitely will, in the beginning of school, uh, be introduced to their guidance counselors if they haven't already. Class schedules will come out closer to the start of school just because uh, we are um, working through the changes that will have to be made based on which students ought to be remote, which are 100% in person. Um, and ex uh, preferences for exploratory schedule. So great, so a question has come in about the situation with students in the life science wing um, and clinicals and co-op. 
So right now, the, the, the health field, certain placements, students are not allowed to go out on because the concern from DESE was about these students going into these higher risk situations um, and then coming back into school. Um, they, Shawshine has been a part of some advocacy along with the Associate Commissioner of uh, Career and Vocational Technical Education um, to work with the state to potentially alter that for schools such as ours where those students would be going out and not be coming back into the building. So we have done everything we can to advocate at our level um, and believe we should be hearing some information soon and we'll communicate that as soon as we can. Um, will the students be required to have scanners to scan work into the computer for their teachers? No, students won't be required to have scanners. Um, there'll be options for them um, to complete the work on screen. Um, if there are students who require accommodations for print sources, they'll be able to get that to teachers when they're in the building um, and we'll work out, but we're not gonna require families to go out and get scanners for their homes. Uh, if a student has difficulty wearing a mask all day, is a shield an option? Um, any student who has medical concerns related to wearing masks um, should reach out to uh, the nurse's office and then we'll explore uh, the face shield option as an alternative for that. Um, Dr. Jackson, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, so in terms of the time to drop your students off in the AM, we are finalizing those procedures and we'll share that out with everyone before the first day of school. Um, and so we will get that to you. And final question up on the screen. Uh, will guidance actively reach out to students about managing anxiety in this pandemic time? Maybe check in on them regularly. Um, yeah, what we'll be doing, we bring staff back um, you know, through the guidance department um, is working on strategies uh, how we can be as proactive as possible to support students. And one more popped up. Um, so again, the option for students to be full in-house for academics, that is going to be reserved for um, the high needs students that we, we identify um, who most require it just because we're limited in the numbers that we can have. Uh, for full in-house academics. And um, I understand the probably the frustration there because we also would love to have all students in the building all the time. But you know, we have to we have to put health and safety first with the guidance at play. So I hope that, you know, when I'm responding to these, no, no one gets the impression that that I like having to say that we can't because I'm an educator because I want to be around students and helping students. And I know that we all feel that way. So any pain you're feeling around it, we feel it as well. So uh, that was our last question, Dr. Jackson. I'll pull you up on the screen here. So um, we, we understand that um, while they, we answered almost 286 questions in the past two hours and 15 minutes, there are undoubtedly going to be more. Um, we will continue to reach out to parents, to students, uh, to staff members to answer questions and also provide additional guidance and information as we develop it. Um, we are working literally 14, 16 hours a day trying to stay ahead of this. Um, and in the two hours that, uh, two hours and 15 minutes where we've been meeting, the commissioner had a, um, a one hour um, get together with all the superintendents and I've been getting text messages from superintendents with information. So information changes all the time and there aren't any significant issues uh, um, brewing that uh, we haven't been anticipating, but there may. So um, we will continue to communicate with you. We will continue to try to be accessible to you. Um, our, um, we, um, really start to swing into uh, into um, return to school mode uh, next Monday when we re um, we welcome back uh, we welcome our um, some new staff members um, to the building um, 
and then teachers will return um, on Wednesday, correct? When we, uh, a week from today? Oh my goodness. Um, and um, then um, they will be in the building for, um, for um, 10 days of professional development and students uh, first day of classes is going to be um, September 14th, which is uh, a little more than a little less than four weeks from today. So um, much will happen. We will definitely going to be studying a lot of the issue, the um, information that was just released about athletics and get an announcement out um, um, as soon as we've uh, digested it and have an understanding about how it impacts um, uh, it impacts um, Shashin. We also understand we have to get some information out about uh, transportation, um, and that's because that's a question where a lot of people asked. Uh, we do hope that today we did answer a lot of your questions. We hope we alleviated some concerns and maybe calmed some fears. Uh, we may have uncovered some new ones as well, um, and we will continue to communicate with you as we uh, go forward um, and prepare for the return of our, stu our students to, uh, to Shawshin. So with that, Jess, I'll turn it over for you, to you for the last word, and we can say good afternoon. Excellent. Um, you know, to just echo some of the things that Dr. Jackson said, um, we are working so hard just to make it a safe and supportive experience for your students to transition back in regardless of what their plan looks like. Um, and at the end of the day, the people who interact with your students the most are our teaching staff and our guidance counselors. Um, it's not myself, it's not Dr. Jackson. And although they are on summer break, um, I have been delighted, but not surprised, because I know our staff, at how engaged they have been with us in this process. We just had a teacher a staff forum, almost every person in the staff logged into it. Um, people are coming in the building, asking how they can help out, looking at their spaces, and overwhelming the messaging that we're getting from folks is, what can I do to help make this process better for students? And when they're coming to us with suggestions and concerns, um, the majority of the time, it's about students' needs. You know, today, a number of their questions were about how are students going to feel prepared to access remotely? Um, what can we do to make students feel more supported in this way or that way? So I know you're only seeing our two faces today, um, but we are small in comparison to the large group of educators that we work with um, that have already been thinking about what they're gonna do to make this a great fall for your students. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, many of you have reached out to me by email. Please reach out anytime. Um, I, I would rather address your concerns sooner so that you feel better. Um, and I hope that you all have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for the, your time investment. Um, in this today. Have a good one. Good night.